Hey guys, hope you're doing well. So today I'll be challenging the Mosaic authorship of the Torah. Now the Torah refers to the first five books of the Old Testament from Genesis until Deuteronomy, and it's sometimes also called the Pentateuch. Now, as opposed to suggesting that these five books were written by a single author, traditionally identified as Moses, I'm going to be arguing that they are rather the work of a compiler, someone that has taken four different sources and fused them together into a single narrative. Now, this is referred to as the documentary hypothesis, and it was first proposed by Julius Wellhausen in the 19th century. Some Christian apologists like Jay Dyer will say that this theory is no longer tenable, but this is not true. It is true that Wellhausen's original form of the theory is no longer accepted, but nonetheless, scholars do accept that the Bible, or rather the Torah specifically, is the product of multiple pieces of, of documents that have been brought together. Okay? In fact, there's a consensus among biblical scholars that the Torah is not the work of a single author. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is that the Torah is full of contradictions, doublets, and abrupt discontinuations in narrative that cannot be explained by the work of a single author. A single author would be expected to have created a single narrative that is at least cohesive and coherent. Instead, we have these contradictions and these features that make that theory impossible. And so as an example, if we were to ask how many pairs of each animal was Noah to bring on the ark? Well, most people will agree with Genesis chapter 6 verses 17 through 22, which says that Noah was ordered to bring one pair of all living animals into the ark. And it ends by saying that Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. But then if we look one chapter later into Genesis chapter 7 verses 1 through 5, now God makes a distinction between clean and unclean animals. It says here that Noah is ordered to take seven pairs of all clean animals and only one pair of unclean animals. And then again, it ends by saying that Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. But what did the Lord command him? Is he to take one pair of all animals? Or is he to distinguish between clean and unclean and take seven pairs of clean animals? The narrative is not consistent. This type of example can't be explained by a single author. A single author wouldn't have composed two varying and contradicting accounts of the same command. Rather, this is better explained by a different document or source that has been brought together and compiled. Let's look at another example, and this is a, an example of an abrupt discontinuation in narrative. This is the blessing of Isaac. I'm sorry, this is Isaac's blessing of Jacob. This is Genesis chapter 27. This takes place when Isaac is on his deathbed. He is described as being old, and his eyes were dim, and he could not see. And he asks his son to prepare delicious food for him, so that his soul may enjoy it before he dies, and give his blessing. So, here's the problem. According to the narrative, if we read it as it's presented by Genesis, Isaac doesn't die for another 21 years. He doesn't die until Genesis chapter 35. Well, how can this be? How can this be the work of a single author? Well, it's not. This is an example of an abrupt discontinuation where the narrative is interrupted so that additional information from another document can be inserted. Okay, So this is just a few sampling, a small sampling of a few examples that shows you that this is the work of a compiler and cannot be explained by the work of a single author. Now, I'll be going off of this book, The Composition of the Pentateuch by Joel S. Baden. And here is Dr. Joel S. Baden. He's a cool guy. He teaches at Yale Divinity School. He's professor of Hebrew Bible. Now, he got his education, his BA from Yale, his master's from the University of Chicago, and his PhD from Harvard University. So in addition to being a cool guy, He's obviously a very smart guy. 
Now, what's good is that part of his book is available on Google Books. I would recommend getting it. It is actually an excellent read, an excellent defense, or not even necessarily a defense, but an, an excellent exposition of the revised documentary hypothesis. And specifically, we'll be going over Dr. Baden's first case, that of the sale of Joseph. So the point here is to show you just how effective the documentary hypothesis is in explaining the Bible. All right, we're going to look at a variation in the story. Um, there's been numerous traditional explanations. They're pretty far out there. But the simplest explanation will be what's contained in this theory. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the sale of Joseph which is Genesis chapter 37, verses 18 through 36. Now, I recommend you pause the video and read this. Make sure you get yourself a good translation. I recommend the English Standard Version. And the reason why I recommend getting a good translation is that many times when translators or translations of the Bible are written by fundamentalist-leaning Christians, the translation is used to obscure difficulties in the text. All right. So I noticed this, for example, in the NIV version that they were trying to obscure some of these difficulties that I'll be pointing out. But get yourself a good translation. And again, I recommend the ESV. All right. So hopefully you had a chance to read that once, maybe twice. And the gist of the story is that uh, the brothers of Joseph want to kill him. Then you have one brother who wants to stop them from killing him, and instead they, he wants to propose just throwing him in a well. And then Joseph is rescued from the well by some merchants, and then he's sold off into Egypt. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, if we're looking from that perspective, yes. But when we analyze this from a literary perspective, when we ask ourselves, what is the plot? How does this story follow? Well, I think you will agree that it's a very clunky narrative. There are these obscure or weird repetitions, uh, uh, these strange transitions, and the story is essentially incomprehensible. We don't really know what is exactly going on here. So, for example, you know, it, it, you have these repetitions here, where, for example, the narrative says that uh, his brothers conspired to kill him, and then it says, come now, let us kill him. We have the brother Reuben say, hey, listen, um, let's not put our hands on him. Let's just throw him into the pit. But then strangely, you have the same or similar uh, thing attributed to the brother Judah. Judah says, let's not put our hands upon him. He is our brother. So why do you have these repetitions? And what's weird is, why is Judah essentially saying something similar after the brothers already took on Reuben's plan? Furthermore, why is Reuben suggesting almost something similar to what the brothers wanted to do? Namely, that the brothers wanted to throw him into the pit. And then the biggest problem of all, who sold Joseph to the Egyptians? Well, according to uh, verse 28, Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took him to Egypt. But when you look at the end of the passage, it says that the Midianites sold Joseph to Egypt. So who was it? Was it the Midianites or the Ishmaelites? Now, what makes it even worse is that Genesis 39 verse 1 says it's the Ishmaelites again who brought Joseph to Egypt. So this is a major contradiction within this passage. Who sold Joseph to the Egyptians? Now, we're going to take a look at a couple classical solutions, and then we'll take a look at the documentary hypothesis solution. All right, so again, these are the problems of the narrative, which I just went over. And now let's go into some of the classical solutions. So the first solution is... Let's just eliminate the problem. Let's cut out the elements of the narrative that we don't like to make the narrative more coherent. The second solution is let's just multiply the sales. Let's introduce some information into the text that's not there 
to make the narrative more intelligible. The third are linguistic gymnastics. Let's try to suggest that maybe these two groups are not really two groups, but one group, and that will solve the problem. And then the fourth solution is really a bonus one, more of a more hilarious scribal attempt to um, solve this problem. But the point is that all of these solutions, so-called, do not really resolve the problem and that the best solution will be found in the documentary hypothesis. So, eliminating the problem. This was done by the Book of Jubilees, which is a 2nd century BCE text, and it simply eliminates the mention of the Midianites and the abduction of Joseph. Okay, so let's eliminate it. Problem solved, right? Not exactly. The second solution is let's multiply the sales. Now, this was noted by Rabbi Judah and also Rabbi Huna. Rabbi Judah suggested that the brothers took Joseph out of the well, sold him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites sold him to some anonymous group of merchants. These merchants then sold him to the Midianites, and then the Midianites sold Joseph to the Egyptians. Uh, Rabbi Huna adds a fifth sale, where in Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar. Okay, so here's the problem with this theory. Who are these merchants? This is not mentioned explicitly in the text. This is an invented step to try to resolve the problem. Now, this is classic Midrash, right? If we have a problem in the text, let's assume a gap and then insert it, and then let's insert some kind of speculation into there to resolve the problem. But it's not satisfactory. So, linguistic gymnastics. Rabbi Rashbam had a theory that the Midianites were Medianites, and Medianites were connected to Ishmaelites. So the idea here is we can play with linguistics to try to suggest that these two groups, Midianites and Ishmaelites, are really one group to thereby solve the problem. Abraham ibn Ezra had a similar theory, and his was simpler. Instead of saying that the Midianites are Medianites who are thereby connected with the Ishmaelites, he simply said Midianites are Ishmaelites. Problem solved, right? Not quite. So... It does not explain why a single group arrives twice in the narrative. Furthermore, it's an ad hoc argument. This is the only time in scripture where Midianites are identified as Ismaelites, and it's specifically done to try to make a text more comprehensible. And then the third problem is one that's sort of in the open. These types of attempts show us that Genesis 37 cannot be interpreted by itself. Rather, appeals need to be made to other parts of Scripture to try to resolve this problem. It sort of confirms that the text is intrinsically problematic. Now lastly, and I'm throwing this in as a bonus, uh, textual scholars uncovered a 12th century scribe who simply invented a hybrid term, the Ishmadanianites, as an attempt to try to solve the problem. So... Have a good laugh at that one. Okay, so now we took a look at different versions or different attempts to solve the problem traditionally. Now let's take a look at Dr. Baden's solution from the composition of the Pentateuch. Again, um, you can read a few chapters online. He spent approximately 20 pages explaining how to resolve or rather how to reconstruct the original passage into what has been reproduced as two separate narratives. Um, so this is from page 38 of his book, which I'm going to read. And look at the simplicity of this reconstruction and how without multiplying problems, without making um, the solution more complex, this is such a straightforward thing. So he reconstructs it as two separate narratives. This is the first narrative. Quote, They said to one another, Here comes that dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we can say, A savage beast devoured him. We shall see what comes of his dreams. When Joseph came up to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the ornamented tunic that he was wearing. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. 
the camels bearing gum, balm, and laudanum to be taken to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain by killing our brother and covering up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let us not do away with him ourselves. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. They sold Joseph for twenty pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who brought Joseph to Egypt. Then they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a kid, and dipped the tunic in the blood. They had the ornamented tunic taken to their father, and they said, We found this. Please examine it. Is it your son's tunic or not? He recognized it and said, My son's tunic. A savage beast devoured him. Joseph was torn by a beast. Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, and observed mourning for his son many days. All his sons and daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, saying, No, I will go down mourning to my son in Sheol. Thus his father bewailed him. Okay, so we can see just from the first narrative, this is coherent. No contradictions. It's a smooth flowing storyline. Now let's take a look at what Dr. Baden proposes as the second text that was uh, reconstructed here. Quote, They saw him from afar, and before he came close to them, they conspired to kill him. But when Reuben heard it, he tried to save him from them. He said, Let us not take his life. And Reuben went on, shed no blood, cast him into that pit out in the wilderness, but do not touch him yourselves intending to save him from them and restore him to his father. They took him and cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to a meal. When the Midianite, when Midianite traders passed by, they pulled Joseph up out of the pit. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he rent his clothes. Returning to his brothers, he said, The boy is gone. Now what am I to do? The Midianites, meanwhile, sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, a courtier of the Pharaoh and his chief steward. Now, this is a coherent narrative. And you see that individually, when you look at these reconstructed texts, they make sense individually. But when you try to combine them, you run into problems. Now, the interesting thing is that the compiler was faithful to the text in the sense that he is not actually picking which story should be preserved and which can be disregarded. Because if he did that, we would not be able to reconstruct the text. Because he was faithful to the separate narratives by not editing them, but simply splicing pieces of one into the other, we are able to reconstruct what may have been the original documents in this storyline. So, I think you can see that instead of positing all these various solutions, which you technically can, right? You can look at each problem posed by Genesis 37 and come up with some kind of solution. But the problem is that the sheer number of these problems, if you look at them holistically, you cannot simply swipe them under the rug. You cannot simply appeal to ad hoc speculative arguments. Rather, you have to face this and recognize that we're dealing with something more complex here, namely the compilation of the text, the fusing of numerous documents together. And when you look at a reconstruction like this that was proposed by Dr. Baden, I think this demonstrates the power of the documentary hypothesis. This shows you how valid this theory is, the fact that it can produce reconstructions like this. Now, the other question that we really have to address ourselves, especially if you're a Christian, is if this is true, how do you understand inspiration? Well, inspiration cannot be a singular event in the past. Rather, inspiration has to be a process that includes separate documents, includes compilation of these documents and redactions and layerings. Inspiration is a process. And furthermore, inspiration is dynamic. 
It's not static. All these things come from Scripture. Scripture encapsulates, or rather uh, captures, this dynamic process in these narratives and teaches us that there is a dynamic principle, not just in Scripture, but in the world, that streams through things like dogmatic development and even, I would dare say, biological evolution. So in this one thing, so much of the mysteries of God are revealed. And I really do encourage you to read over the work of Dr. Baden. Again, uh, some of his book is available online. Do read it. Do learn about it. And see that scripture is far more complex and far more beautiful than what fundamentalists propose.